actually when I was in high school, I uh, had a teacher uh, in history and uh, uh, chemistry, believe it or not, who was very interested in diplomacy. And so she used to invite a consuls general from around the area. I grew up in Portland, Oregon. So they come from San Francisco, Los Angeles, and from Seattle. And she'd have them speak about what they did in the United States. The more I learned, the more times they appeared, uh, um, where I became uh, then was someone who was very interested in what they were doing, especially the Foreign Service of the United States. So I said to her, I want to be in the Foreign Service. I want to be a diplomat. She said, well, go ahead. And uh, then I began to chat with uh, people whom she put me in touch with about the Foreign Service. A couple of them went to school where I went to school years earlier. They came and spoke. They talked about languages, visiting places, opening windows. And I said, this is for me. So I never lost the interest. But it certainly it keeps the United States in touch with the world. That's one of the more important things. Also, the Foreign Service tells the United States what certain things are going on, what, what, what is happening. It tells the United States about actors in the process, which is very important, because they're humans just like we are. Also, when they have uh, problems, people like uh, Putin or or the president of New Mexico, or South America, and wherever. The Foreign Service keeps in touch with them for the United States government, and also for the United States in general, communities included. Uh, the, uh, the president was Ronald Reagan at that time, and the uh, people in, in the United States, especially people of color, were a little bit I think they were upset that the United States had not had a very proactive policy towards South Africa in terms of getting rid of apartheid. So one of uh, President Reagan's advisors suggested, let's send a black ambassador there. Maybe they'll tone people down in the United States a bit. They weren't thinking about a career officer, though. They were thinking about a political appointee. And they actually uh, picked someone who had been around uh, the Republican White House for a long time. And then uh, his uh, business activities in Africa were, they weren't suspect, but he had several business activities. He decided to withdraw any consideration, even though he had not been asked about it. And then Secretary Schultz, one of the great secretaries of state, actually said to the president, look, the South African situation is anathema to us. It's also in contravention of what we believe in as a nation. I think it is time to send a black ambassador, but I think we ought to send a career ambassador. Let me find a, a list and see if I can recommend somebody and you can interview it. And after he went the list down, uh, he called me one day in Monrovia over my first ambassadorship. He called and he said, listen, you must have been hearing a lot about us sending a black to South Africa. I said, I have, Mr. Secretary. He said, well, I've asked for all the names of people who might be uh, suitability, who might be suitable for the post. And uh, I always ask for another list. Your name appears on all the lists. So I'm asking you, let me send your name over to the president. I had someone he can interview. And I said, yes. And he said, okay, but you can't tell anybody about this except your wife. And thus, uh, I didn't. Then uh, I got a, a telephone call the next day from a deputy secretary saying, can you get to Washington without anybody seeing you from Liberia? I said, it's kind of hard, but I guess I could get an un unmarked seat. He said, do that and come in and don't even stop at the airport, just keep going and be able to touch with you. So that weekend, I uh, was uh, called by the White House, by the President's Secretary, and said to me, 
the president wants to see you Saturday morning, and we'll send the car for to pick you up. And they sent an unmarked car to my, my daughter's uh, house where she was living. She was going to graduate school here in Washington. And then I went into the White House in an unmarked entrance and uh, was taken to a room I'd never seen before. I now know it was a, it's called the map room. And um, my escort said, well, just wait. The president will be here in a few minutes. And I waited for about 10 minutes, and then in strolled Ronald Reagan, flanked by uh, his two aides, Poindexter and uh, Reagan, I guess his name is. And the president just, they went to the back of the room. He came over and he shook my hand and said, thanks for coming to my house. I have a seat here on the couch. I need to get to know who you are. So the president then set, on, set out on a series of uh, questions to really get to know who I was. I wanted to know where I was born, where I grew up, uh, what kind of family life I had, where I went to school, what I studied. And then he, he asked me about uh, South Africa. What do you know about South Africa? I said, well, I know this. That situation down there is not one that uh, we would approve of. He said, well, you know, uh, George Schultz has asked me to interview you as a possible next ambassador. If I send you, what are you going to do? Uh, and of course, I had no idea what, what I would do. But I winged it, if, you, if I can say that. And I said, well, the situation there is anathema to us. We don't believe in that. And yet we have good relations with that apartheid government. So if you send me, Mr. President, I'm really going to try to change things. He said, really? That's kind of interesting. How are you going to do it? And uh, I said to myself, you really shouldn't have answered it like that. But I said that uh, we believe in a, in a certain form of government. And we think we are individualistic in our growth rate and the way we grow up. So I think the South Africans need to know that the United States does not agree with this system. And that if they want relations with us, they're going to have to change. So it's going to be my job to, to tell them that and to make it realistic. He said, tell me more. What, what, what about who are you going to talk to? I said, all the blacks, if I can get to them. He said, because they think you are a racist, Mr. President. He said, yeah, I've heard that. He said, well, what will you tell them? Uh, I said, I will try to convince them that you are not a racist, that you are an American, and that you uphold the Constitution, our Constitution, and that, uh, and that you believe that everybody can make it in America. And I'm going to see if I can convince them of that, too. He said, what about the white people? I said, yes, I will get in touch with them as well and tell them the same thing. I said, there are uh, actually four or five groups there. But it seems to me that South Africa has been promised twice to two groups, once to the Afrikaners, once to the blacks. But the others, the coloreds, Asians, have a role to play as well. So I need to make sure that they understand that. And everything I do, Mr. President, seems to me must be pointed towards your desire as a representative of the United States to change things, and I'll try to do that. I did, uh, I did not later. After, uh, before I met the president, I got a great briefing. And most of the briefing was about constructive engagement. And I quickly, how shall I say this? I think I quickly came to the view that uh, constructive engagement meant to at least many of the black population in the United States appeasement of the whites. And that all the blacks had to do was sit tight and they would inherit the earth, so to speak, using a metaphor there. When the president talked to me, I told him that I think the concept of apartheid is uh, past it, so it won't work anymore. And I think that I'll have to I'll have to disavow it as the ambassador. 
He said, that's going to be pretty tough, isn't it? I said, well, if I'm going as your emissary and you want me to make policy in South Africa, I'll make that policy when I get there. He said, tell me once again, uh, uh, you grew up in Oregon. How many black people do you know in the United States? <laughs> I said, a lot of them, Mr. President. He said, what do you think they'll think of you for taking this job from Ronald Reagan? I said, I don't know. He said, I can tell you they won't like it. And if you, don't, if you are going to have any success in South Africa, you need to get out into the country and meet as many black leaders and people as you can. Because if you have any success, in my judgment, you're going to need them, maybe a hell of a lot more than you're going to need me. So uh, that was a part of my, my knapsack, which I, which I did after I was uh, nominated to the Senate. And the Senate uh, voted me out. Then I went on a trip around the country, various places, to churches, to talk to church leaders, and to some schools, uh, some of the historically black colleges and universities, to tell them that I, what they already knew, because it was a kind of a cause to live, I said, I want to, want to ask you questions about, about what you think of South Africa and the fact that there's going to be a black ambassador there. Almost to a person, they said, look, uh, we think that man is using you. And it's not, the, uh, it's not really the messenger, it's the message you're carrying. What's the message? So I told him about that. You think he will back you up? And when you get in the corner, I said, well, he's the President of the United States. President of the United States, I have to believe that uh, what he says is exactly what he intends to do. It was uh, not pleasant, but um, I had to present credentials. And uh, they were presented on the steps of the Union Building which is where the executive offices are. And he allowed uh, the uh, chief of protocol to set it up with uh, uh, what I call bugles and horns. But he had one, uh, one uh, black regiment, not a regiment, a black company, and one white company to play the Star Spangled Banner and the Spiel, I guess that's what they call that uh, national anthem. And I was to stand on the steps of the Union Building, one step below him, and hand him the credentials. Um, I was allowed to have with me my deputy and the next senior officer in the, in the embassy. And they stood beside me. And the president had his special assistants and the head of that foreign service with him. I learned earlier that he intended to have me look up at him as I was handing him the credentials. But someone forgot to measure me, and I, I was actually the, the same height as him when he was standing on the step above me. We were looking into each other's eyes. And I wouldn't avert my eyes. I just handed him the paper. And he inverted, he had to avert his eyes, and he got mad. I could tell, I could see the color in his, his cheeks. After that, uh, he said, come on inside. And I said, I'll have my two aides join me. No, I want, I want you in here. So he sat down, and I told him, I said, well, Mr. President, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. This is a crucial time between our two countries, and I hope that I can do something about changing the relationship. He said, wait a minute. You think relations between our, between our two countries can succeed when your Congress has just declared war, economic warfare on my country? you got to be kidding. He said, wait a minute, I, I made a mistake. He said, it was your Congress only that did this. Not, your, not the president, he's a good guy. I said, nevertheless, I have to get out in the country and get to know South Africa. Then he stuck his finger in my face and said, look, I've heard about you. Don't you get involved in our affairs. I'm warning you. So we talked a bit more. I said, well, Mr. President, I, I'm happy to be here. 
I'm going to travel a lot in South Africa and get to know the people. And he stuck his finger in my face again. He said, you didn't hear me, did you? I don't want you traveling around our country. I don't want you getting involved in our affairs. I said, Mr. President, how can I care of my job? I said, we send emissaries for the purpose of getting to know the people of the country, as well as talk to the president and the foreign minister. He, he began to uh, actually rant and rave. <laughs> and his aides were visibly shaken because he was acting out of political area courtesy. Then he stopped. OK, welcome. Goodbye. The next time I saw him was the opening of parliament. And uh, as Lucy and I walked up to shake hands with him, I said, this is not going to be good, so brace yourself. So I was in front of him, he looked at me, well, Mr. Ambassador, we meet again. How are you getting along in our country? I said, well, sir, thanks for asking. I'm learning about South Africa and your people. He would say, well, he just looked at me, and I went, by, I went on. I never had a civil conversation with him during my entire time there. And we met four or five times. It was always the same. So if, if one is to look at uh, teeing off the head of state as a means of making change, mine was very easy, <laughs> but not really. As far as the whites were concerned, especially the Afrikaners, it was a very hostile encounter all the time, even though they feigned uh, uh, courtesy. Especially the uh, newspapers, the Die Bild, uh, which is a very famous newspaper in South Africa, and others, and many of the uh, English-speaking whites as well. They were anti, uh, anti-Perkins, I guess, and felt that I was uh, exacerbating the situation. The coloreds, many of them were, were in fighting form. Um, and were allies in uh, attempting to make, make, make a difference in South Africa. The blacks, um, when I arrived, it was a mixed reception. The black leadership, about five of them, had taken a vow just before I came that because I was appointed by Ronald Reagan, they would not cooperate with me. This, this was Desmond Tutu and uh, several others. And thus, when I arrived, I uh, thought the best thing to do was to have a dinner with one of the leaders of this group. Albertina Sisulu, her husband, Walter Sisulu, went to jail with, Mac with uh, Mandela. So I had someone call her and ask her if she would come to the residence in Pretoria and have dinner with the new ambassador. That was a week after I arrived. To everyone's surprise, she accepted. Came with her good friend, uh, June, whose husband was also in, on Robin Island and had a great time, about six of us, uh, four from the United States and she and her companion. And as she got up to leave, I, I, I had her driven back to uh, uh, Soweto. And she turned to me and she said, well, Mr. Bester, welcome to South Africa. She says, I know you're wondering why I'm meeting with you in view of the, bot, uh, the, the boycott of the black leaders. I said, yes, I am wondering about it. She said, it's very simple. You are a black man, and you can't be all bad. She turned out to be one of my, my uh, uh, best helpers while I was there, all over the, over the place. She was one of the, I would say she was one of the most effective leaders in South Africa at that time. It's unfortunate that she died uh, before a time.
uh, it's a little difficult to say what role I played because uh, my job, I thought, was to uh, make change. And so I called the leadership of the embassy together and I told them that uh, henceforth the embassy had to be a giant change agent. I said, that's our job. Secondly, I said, every place I go and everything I do must be uh, pushed towards change. Every speech I give must be a change speech. And as I traveled around the country, I got to know leaders, black leaders in the villages. That was always my message. And I also went to Africana communities. And there were a lot of poor Africanas there as well. And I, I would uh, uh, meet with their leaders as well. And they wanted, I said, because you need to hear from me what's going to happen. I said, apartheid is going to go. So, Mr. Bess, how can you be so sure? I said, because South Africa cannot exist with this kind of a system in the world of governments. And I'm saying now that uh, President Ronald Reagan is behind the effort to eradicate apartheid. Depending on where I went was how well I was received. The intelligence people followed me around a great deal. Um, I hoped it was to protect me because I turned down a protective detail, either from the United States or from South Africa. I said, if somebody wants to kill me, they can kill me. But I'm not going around with a bunch of uh, guards. and never did. The black South African leadership finally decided that uh, they would cooperate with me. Desmond Tutu was the last one to come around. And he came around, he said, well, Mr. Bastard, Mrs. Sassou is right. You're, you're a black person, you can't be all bad, so uh, we should uh, work with you, I think. How did the uh, population at large deal with me? Well, that's a mixed bag as well. The first day in South Africa, I got in the car at the residence and was traveling down to the embassy. And alongside the car running were black newsboys saying something. I don't know what it was. So I had said to Edison, the driver, I said, what are they saying? They're saying, look, he's here. He's here. I said, what do they mean? He, you, Mr. Vesta. You're the person. There was a lot of that wherever I went. Blacks were skeptical as hell about uh, the United States. If we were really sincere, the longer I stayed, the more convinced they became that we really were trying to make a uh, change. At the end of the day, I can say this. When I arrived, the Del Mas treason trial was going on. These were the trial of six uh, young black men who had advocated change in structures, schools, welfare agencies, or what have you. And they'd been put on trial by the government for treason. And they held the trial at a place called Delmas, which was uh, north of Pretoria, because they didn't want people coming to the trial and agitated. But they couldn't stop people from coming. They, and they got there any way they could, bicycle, trolleys, cars, buses. So the political counselor said to me, uh, you know, Mr. Best, if you really want to make a, a splash to let people know you're here, you ought to appear at the Delmas treason trial, unannounced. So a couple weeks later, that's what we did. I went to his desk, I said, Bob, let's go. We're going to Delmas. And um, got in the car and the driver said, where to, Mr. Best? I said, Delmas. He said, you sure? Well, I'm sure, I'm sure, uh, as I am sitting here, that the uh, security service had bought him off. But it's better to have a, a keck and goose in the house where you are than where, waiting for one to come in. So uh, I didn't let him stop anywhere. Cause I knew he was going to call his, his uh, contact and say, Ambassador Perkins is going to Delmas. So when we arrived, I went inside, up on the balustrade, and looked around. 
and a man named Tara Lakota was testifying. He later became Minister of Defense you know, in the Mandela administration. Tara was testifying. He looked up at me and he threw his fist in the air and kept on testifying. By the time tea time came, which is about 10.30, they had all gotten together, these six people. I don't know how they did it. And they had listed a, a, a list of six or seven demands that they wanted to make on me as a as ambassador. They wanted someone from the American Embassy in the trial every day. They wanted Time, and Newsweek, the New York Times, and the Wall Street Journal. And I said, yeah, we'll get them for you. Well, the government uh, convicted them, and the next day they pardoned them because the time had come when they couldn't do that anymore. That was one of the biggest significant changes that I know of.